go ahead and hit the uh, approval there. And uh, my recollection was that unfortunately we did stop in the middle of um, a module here in chapter um, three. Um, so we're going to go ahead and finish up that module. And my recollection was that we stopped with joint costing, right? Okay. So what happens? We have a situation with joint costing where we are going to have a uh, joint product. Okay. So we'll have uh, two different um, products that are somehow related. Okay. For example, and let's just look at the uh, notion here, joint products or two or more products that are generated from a common input. And I've seen this described, uh, say we have uh, Nike and say we have basketball, shoes, we have what? We have running shoes. Okay, now this is probably incorrect. I mean, you know, official from Nike could, you know, pop out from behind me now and say, well, that's actually not how it works. So, I mean, I'm just, you know, kind of playing around here. But we have basketball shoes, we have running shoes. These might be joint products where up until some point, you cannot distinguish a running shoe from a basketball shoe, okay? Now, what happens? At some point, there's a split off and it's split off now these products start to take on their individual characteristics as say the running shoe versus the um, basketball shoe. We also have byproducts and byproducts are a product of relatively small value that come off of the ingredients that make the joint products. I don't know, do they still have that Nike store in San Francisco? I used to go in there every now and then and you'd get close to the cash register and they have these little, you know, Nike swoosh balls that you can buy, you know, and uh, those are probably stuff that come off as byproducts from the rubber and whatnot that they don't use to make the actual uh, joint products, the main products in this example, the basketball and the running shoes, okay? Now, what we're going to have to see is that there are certain costs that are a uh, joint product cost. And if we have joint product costs, meaning that there are direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead that equally go into the two separate products, then we're gonna have to figure out how to allocate so much of that to say running shoes versus uh, basketball shoes in this example. Now, as you continue to process those things, then after they've split off into their two uh, categories of product, then there will be a separable cost that, of course, will be easily traceable to the two separate products. Now, what we're going to see as we try to allocate those joint costs, we're going to allocate them using, and it's going to be three different methods. We could use the uh, unit volume. We can use sales value at split off. Or if there is no sales value at split off, we can use net realizable value at split off to uh, allocate these uh, joint costs. Now, when you see a problem like this, they will always call out the joint cost. Okay, and what I always tell um, you know CPA candidates is pull that number out first. You've got to pull that number out because that's the number that you're going to allocate between the two products. Then you need to read the problem to try to understand, well, what method am I using? And in this particular case, they're telling us to determine the portion of joint cost that 10,000 will be allocated to each product using the um, volume method, okay? So what happens? We look and we have this manufacturing produces two products and um, the product A, and product B were 25,000 and 50,000 um, uh, uh, respectively. And then we have the joint cost of 10,000. In order to allocate the joint cost, the company uses the proportional gallons of production for its two products. They give me the gallons. And so we go ahead and we simply use the uh, proportion of gallons for product A, product B, the total of 30,000. And that's how we allocate those joint costs, okay? Notice that they tell us that um, product A and product B direct costs associated with manufacturing A and B, the 25 and the 50,000 are completely ignored here, right? We simply took the joint cost 
and use the volume information to assign those costs. And then I guess since they asked for total costs, I guess we use those to pick those up and then added the amount of uh, joint costs that were allocated. But to actually allocate the cost, you didn't need to worry about those direct costs. Question? Okay, good. You come over and you take a look at our net realizable value at split off point. And uh, if there is an ability to sell the product at split off, we could use those relative sales values to um, allocate the joint costs. Now, again, first thing I always um, you know, encourage the class to do or encourage my students to do is sit there and say, well, the joint product costs are 1,000. I pick up that number. I put it somewhere because I know that that's the number that I'm going to allocate. So I don't have to worry about picking up that number anymore. Now, they tell me that uh, 100 units of A at split off um, could be sold for $20 per unit and 400 units of B could be sold at $15 a unit. So I pick up those numbers. I pick up the $20 of product A at $100 a unit, multiply that out. I pick up the product B, 400 units at $15, extend that out. I have a total sales value of 8,000. And then I allocate my joint cost using the relative values at split off and sales value at split off to allocate the joint cost. Question. Okay, now this assumes that you might have uh, two joint products that you could sell without any further processing. That may not be realistic. Again, going back to our idea of the, um, you know, running shoes versus basketball shoes, as you can imagine, you know, some of the basic elements that might be consistent between both of those are going to start to change pretty significantly. There's going to be further processing involved. So we may need to look at net realizable value after uh, the split off. So when we take a look at something like that, now coming over to the next page, and let's just take a look at how we would do that. Now we have Smith Company, and Smith Company produces two joint products, F and G. Joint production costs for October were 30,000. There's my magic number that I know I'm always going to pick up because I know that I have to allocate that. And then during October, further processing costs beyond the split off point separable needed to convert the product into a saleable form were 16,000 uh, and 24,000 for 1,600 units of F and 800 units of G. Sometimes half the battle is reading, you know, the poor way they write these things up to keep track of what's going on with these. They tell us that F sells for $25 per unit, G sells for $50 per unit. So I go ahead, I pick those up, $25 per unit. I have what, $50 per unit for the two products, G and F here. I extend that out, but then they told me that what, that we had 24,000, uh, 16,000 of cost for product F and 24,000 for product G. So I go ahead and I subtract those numbers off. And now I have the net realizable value um, at split off for these two different products, basis 40,000. And then I simply go ahead and do the, the allocation using those numbers. And I have allocated those 30,000 of costs. Question. Okay, let's just look at byproducts. Okay, and byproducts again are those little swoosh balls that we talked about. Okay, and there's two different ways to deal with byproducts. Okay, any proceeds from the sale of a byproduct are a reduction of common cost for joint product costing. The revenue earned from their sales is a credit to joint costs incurred either at the time of the production or at the time of sale. So we'll take that number, that 30,000, and if we had a sale of a byproduct 10,000, then we're going to only allocate 20,000 of those costs between those two products, or we could just simply treat it as a miscellaneous income and um, just treat it on the income statement as a gross amount of miscellaneous income. Flashcard, those two treatments. Question. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at a couple of questions then. Our first couple for tonight.
Okay, guys, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this question. And uh, this actually has a little bit of a um, throwback to our uh, lecture from last time, because uh, we did stop in the middle of the module here. Uh, so a manufacturing company has several product lines, traditionally has allocated manufacturing overhead between product line based on total machine hours for each product line. Under a new activity-based costing, which of the following overhead costs was most likely have a new cost driver? Well, if we were using um, uh, machine costs to allocate um, our overhead costs to each job, then electricity expense might be a valid driver because machines run on electricity. Repair and maintenance might be a legitimate uh, driver because you have to keep the machines maintained and uh, you know repaired in order to use them. Depreciation expense might be reasonable because we're depreciation depreciating that equipment, right? Employee benefit expense, it's a little difficult to see the connection between machine costs and employee benefit expense. And so they might look for another um, you know, driver to allocate those costs, maybe the number of full-time employees or something like that. So uh, that's why item C, which most of us got correct, is the uh, right answer. Question? Okay. Remember, activity-based costing, we have multiple drivers, right? Okay, good. Let's go ahead now and take a look at this next question, which is going to be uh, more in line with what we've been talking about now for our joint cost.
Okay, guys, let's go ahead and take a look at this one. Looks like most of you had a chance to uh, spend some time with it. And um, we have a pretty nice turnout here that um, looks like 87% of us got it right. So I think you can see that these joint cost questions are not uh, terribly difficult. And I'm glad to see that nobody selected D. Uh, that's great because you can't allocate more costs than are the joint costs here, right? Oh, no, I take that back because they did have 60,000. Okay, so uh, since it's 60,000, I take that back, strike that earlier statement. I thought that uh, they had a larger number than the total joint cost. If they did, um, then you would know that, um, you know, that was a wrong answer. Or if they gave you the joint cost, you know that that's the wrong answer because how can you allocate all the joint costs to one product and they're just asking us for AJAC, okay? Now, I always get annoyed with the way CPA exam sets things up. Wouldn't it be nice if they just put the numbers on the right side so we could do a quick calculation, what we're used to looking left to right? Instead, they kind of put the separable costs that we have to subtract off of each one of these on the wrong side, so to speak. Okay, so you could just kind of sit there and say, well, 8,000 minus 80,000 minus 8,000 is 72,000. Right, because we have to subtract those costs that happen uh, after split off or the separable cost after split off. And then we have the 40,000 minus 22 is the 18,000. So we have a base here, what, of 90,000. Okay, then you just select the one that they're asking us for, which is AJAC. So AJAC constitutes what, 72,000 of the total 90. And you do the math on that, and that's how you got the correct answer, the 48,000. Okay, remember guys, CPA exam, half the battle is being systematic in how you attack these questions, right? So you want to get used to the repetition of, okay, what are the key numbers that I have to pull out? I have to pull out those joint costs, and then I'm going to have to do something to deal with these uh, separable costs to take them off the sales value. That's going to be my base. And then you just look to, and they typically ask for one of these. And a question like this, which I gave you about three minutes to uh, work this, really should take you less than a minute to work through something like this as you start to uh, build some speed on these. Question. Okay, good. Good work on that one. So let's go ahead then and let's take a look at performance. Uh, management and they have two different parts. I'm not sure why we have to break these into two parts other than to have more bite-sized modules, I guess. But uh, we're going to be talking about financial measures a little bit later. And we're going to be seeing that there's quite a few ratios and whatnot that they're going to expect us to understand. But we're going to start off the discussion with non-financial uh, measures. Okay. Now, I find these things um, you know, when we look at these, even though we're going to show you some calculations on some of them, they tend to be more um, definitional than they do uh, calculation type uh, questions and considerations that we're going to have to look at. So we start out with productivity measures and a productivity measure that you're telling us is an external benchmark and they tell us that it's external because they tell us that productivity, productivity is defined as the measure of the ratio of outputs achieved to the inputs of production. Productivity is a measure of efficiency and uses the relationship derived from actual performance in comparison to similar organizations over time. Thus the point that what? That they are considered external um, measures, non-financial measures. So flashcard that definition. And we're going to have two types. And I find this, you know, who cares about the two types? One is going to be total. One is going to be partial. When we're talking total, why don't you go ahead and flashcard what the two types are, total versus partial. And what we're going to see is that when we look at partial, we'll actually look at that first on the example on the next uh, page here. So flashcard what the two types are of productivity ratios. We'll see that partial is going to focus on the larger input and just measure the productivity based on that larger input. Total will consider all inputs major or maybe some that may be more minor. 
Okay, so let's just come over and let's look at this sort of silly little example over here. And we're going to first do the partial, as I mentioned, and then we'll do the total, which we've abbreviated partial PPR here and the total TPR. Okay, so let's just look at this. We've got this garden uh, furnishing ink produces outdoor garden sculptures for its high end niche market. And each sculpture is manufactured by the company and includes two raw materials with plastic being the largest input. Thus, when we do the partial, we'll focus on the largest one. We'll focus on the plastic only. And it begs the question, how, I, how high end could these things be if they're made of mostly plastic, but whatever. Let's just go ahead and accept that. And so they say during the previous month, the company used 20,000 pounds of plastic and then 5,000 pounds of cement. So cement is the more minor of the two, obviously, from that description. Material prices at the time are $1.25 for the um, plastic and $1.75 for the plaster. And um, we take a look now, and when we just do the plastic, we sit there and we come up with a productivity ratio of the 1,000 units divided by the 20,000 pounds of input, in this case, the plastic. And so it's 0.5 pounds of plastic uh, per unit. Now, if we use the total, then we have to take a little bit of a different approach. And what they do here, they still have the thousand garden sculptures in the numerator, but in the denominator, they weight the inputs by the respective price associated with each one of those, right? And so now we come up with this 0 0.02963, and that's really cents, right, of output per dollar of uh, input. And um, okay, they used everything here. Question? Okay, good. Now, when we talk about internal benchmark um, techniques, and we're going to look at a few of them, one is a control chart. Okay, when we look at a uh, control chart, control charts are an important tool used to statistically quality, uh, statistically quality, used in statistical quality control, SQC. And it tells the control chart show whether there's a trend towards improved quality conformance or deteriorating quality performance or conformance. So go ahead and flashcard that. And you take a look at this, and I guess this stuff is kind of interesting, especially these days, because a lot of the data analytics is getting into well, how do you present the information? You can see that this control chart is showing that what? We're living with, within upper and lower limits that we've set. We're pretty close to an average. And if you look, our performance is what? Performance deteriorated for some time over some of these batches and now has begun to improve and is pretty much on where we expect it to be uh, within the control chart. And so this is a good visual that could go along with the analysis uh, given here. So they uh, talk about, for example, um, we have a machine that makes rubber tires with each batch consisting of 10,000 truck tire, dry, uh, tup. it's going to be one of those nights, truck tires. Given management's historical experience with the product line, the company has set up an upper end rate defect of 15 per pet for batch and also establish a lower end defect rate of five tires per batch. Now, sometimes you think, well, why wouldn't they want zero? Well, there's a cost associated with getting zero defects per batch, right? And so they've set it within certain limits and the result graphically displayed above indicates that the production batches interval are all within the upper and lower tire defect specifications. Furthermore, the pattern of production shows a general decline in defects four more batches were produced for each, supplement, uh, each subsequent monthly time interval. And number eight uh, is an outlier with more tire defects, um, the 11 and then the 10, you can kind of see some of those outliers there. Okay, so I think you kind of probably figured that out with us without us reading through that. Now, 
you know, this lower limit thing always makes me think, so what are you telling me that if I start to get towards these lower limits, I should start messing up tires on purpose, you know, so that I'm back towards this average. And uh, I'd say, no, you know, you'd probably go ahead and accept that unless you feel like you were just, you know, getting some sort of exorbitant cost associated with living in these lower limits. Okay. And of course, I got to drop my pen. One second, guys. I dropped it. I don't know where it went. One minute. I don't know where it went. It decided to go to wherever things go when you drop them, when they decide to disappear. I'm going to have to get on the ground to find it. If I was by myself, I would have said, where is that fucking thing? But since I'm not by myself, I didn't say that, right? Okay, let's go ahead and let's take a look at the uh, next one, which is the Pareto diagram. And um, I actually had proposed one time on an assignment that um, I was on with the GAO where we were looking at causes of noncompliance findings um, at uh, housing agencies. Housing agencies are, uh, are local government entities. They're usually organized under the city structure. And uh, they receive funding from the federal government, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And what we were proposing at that point in time was that um, HUD take a look at the single audit reports that were required for all housing agencies because they were expending a certain amount of federal financial assistance and that they chart those problems and see the frequency of those problems. So then they could develop some measures of performance housing, um, uh, housing agency performance um, that would focus in on the most common problems. And uh, so we went through and analyzed a bunch of those single audit reports to see what the causes of noncompliance were. And at the time I was saying, well, what we can do is a Pareto diagram that would you know, basically show the most frequent and often uh, causes of problems, findings in the um, compliance of, with HUD rules and regulations for housing agencies and uh, use that as a display in our report. And we were making the point, point we did that. We were making the point that HUD should do that. Um, sometimes what you find, guys, is you come up with a great idea as to how something should be displayed or used or you learn something and you say, hey, let's use this. And somehow that hit the cutting room floor. So they never used this idea that I was saying, which was, hey, let's develop a Pareto diagram. But that's what the Pareto diagram does. And you can see if you're, you know, sitting there and, you know, you have a type one problem is causing most of the defects, then you obviously do what? Focus on the type one problem first, then type two, and you barely don't spend as much attention worrying about type six problems because they are not generating nearly as many defects as the type one. Okay. Okay, good. Cause and effect fishbone diagram, and they call it fishbone because it looks like a fishbone. Okay. And so what happens? Cause and effect diagram provides a framework for managers to analyze problems to contribute to the occurrence of defects and the fishbone uh, managers use the diagram to identify the sources of problems in the production process by resources and take uh, corrective action. They say managers use this and again, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Okay, you know, you walk in to your first day, you know, as the uh, person that's responsible for quality control. And you'll say, well, let's do a fishbone diagram. You'll be saying, what? No, we're going to use this, right? But you can see 
that they have these different effects um, that are causing the problems. And so uh, you can get to the root causes of the problems, working out the problems that uh, are leading to the defects. So you'd be really focusing on this information here. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at now some of our financial measures. So we said that we would get into financial measures here a little bit later. So we are now there, okay? And we have something called responsibility segments. Um, there was a time where we might also call these responsibility centers, okay? But these days they call them responsibility segments and then they go a little further and they call them uh, referred to as strategic business units, okay? So what happens? We have a cost SBU and a cost SBU does what? Um, we are generally classified in four categories, okay? In which managers may be held accountable. And the first one you see is a cost SBU. Then we'll talk about a revenue SBU. And uh, we can flashcard these four. Okay, you'll see them continuing on the next page, but they're pretty uh, self-explanatory. Costs SBUs are responsible for what? Controlling costs. Revenue SBU are responsible for generating revenue. Continuing on to the next page and continuing that flashcard. Our profit SBUs, hello, are responsible for what? responsible for hitting a target profit, which probably means they're responsible for both revenue and cost, right? Co revenue minus cost are gonna generate profit. And then finally, we have the investment SBU, which is held accountable for return on assets, okay? Assets invested, nothing major uh, there, nothing earth shattering there, but you can just go ahead and flashcard that. Okay. Now, when we take a look um, we can also set up our areas of accountability through product lines, geographic areas, and customers. I'm not even asking you to flashcard that. Well, you can. Strategic business units are often subdivided into these, but that's sort of like, you know, peanut butter and jelly, you know, introduction to business type of discussion, but you can go ahead and flashcard that. Now, when we look and we're looking at evaluating our SBUs, okay? Then our profit SBUs are generally going to be uh, evaluated based on their controllable cost. Now, this is important, okay? So take a look at the controllable margin. And we have what? We have our controllable, right here, controllable margin, okay? Contribution margin as you know, is revenue minus variable cost. I'm not gonna ask you to flashcard that, okay? They, they contribute to fixed cost and then of course profit. And when we have a controllable margin, contribution margin and controllable fixed cost, and controllable fixed costs are costs that managers can influence in less than one year. For example, say advertising costs, they give us that there, right? Okay, now when we look at common costs. Common costs are costs for which there is um, really no control. They are not controllable. So financial scorecards that use contribution reporting uh, in these costs, they are common costs are generally not controllable and therefore would not be used to evaluate the performance. So you do not allocate uh, non-controllable costs. For example, the CEO salary, I can't control that as a manager, okay? So you take a look at this contribution reporting and you have the contribution margin, which you know are revenue minus our um, variable cost. And we're gonna be talking about using these in break-even analysis, potentially if we get into chapter four here tonight. And then we have a contribution margin, for each one of these. Now I look at this and I'm thinking, hey, region four is pretty good, right? Now what they do here is, you know, something that you should not do. So let's just put in here, non-controllable fixed costs. No, don't do this. Okay, no, you don't do this. Okay, they're showing you what distortion would happen if you had some sort of arbitrary, um, 
allocation of your costs to these non-controllable costs to these various regions. And maybe they're doing it based on, you know, number of employees or something. And it might not be weird that region four has more employees because they're generating more revenue. And if you sit there and you start allocating things like the CEO salary based on employees or something, all of a sudden you create this distortion in which it looks like what region four is not uh, contributing uh, as much. Meanwhile, they're the bigger contributor to the overall profitability of the company. Okay, so you do not allocate non controllable fixed costs for this kind of an evaluation. Now, if you're doing some sort of gap presentation for segment reporting, more along the lines of the FAR exam, then yeah, you might go ahead and do this as you're reporting segment information that you're required to, but you would not do this for an internal analysis of these units. Question? Okay. Okay, good. Now, when we look at balance scorecard, we have different types of pieces of the balance scorecard and we have different critical success factors we'll be looking at, financial, internal business purposes, uh, processes, I should say, customer satisfaction, advancement and innovation and human resources development, learning and growth, okay? Flashcard these as success factors, okay? And you start to take a look at this example, okay? And what they do, is for each one of these uh, perspectives, they sit here and they call out some uh, critical success factors. So you have, for example, uh, looking at this one, the critical success factor um, that might be relevant to a financial uh, is going to be, you know, this would line up with the capturing additional market share. And the critical success factor here is what? maintaining a customer base. You can't run before you walk. You can't walk before you crawl, right? So they're saying, hey, cr critical success factor in capturing additional market share is maintain the customer base, right? And then you're gonna have some tactics that will get you more towards what you're trying to do here, such as steadily expand services, et cetera, okay? Maintaining low cost, and you look at critical success factor here, maintaining low cost, okay? And um, for maintaining low cost as one of our internal business processes, maintain consistent production in order to maintain cost. If you're you know, having a lot of defects and whatnot, and you're not maintaining consistent production, you can't run before you, um, before you, you know, walk, you want to at least maintain consistent production to maintain low cost. Becoming the low cost leader, okay, and you come down here and that would uh, be something that would line up with the customer perspective, right, and the critical success factor here, anticipate customer needs before competitors do, um, you know, that again is sort of just a basic baseline where you want to get before you can start looking towards that improvement. Linking strategy and reward, that probably falls under the what idea of tactics, um, under advanced learning, I should say, and innovation. And so tactics is promote an entrepreneurial culture. And then as you move along, as you improve, you would be able to, um, well, uh, I went too far. I wanted to go with the critical success factor here, which I guess they didn't give us a critical success factor for some reason. I don't know why. Oh, well. Okay. Well, for whatever reason, they didn't have a critical success factor. I'm not sure why, but I'm not going to argue with them at this point. It's not that major. Okay. The key thing would be what would be right here that this is, you'd have different perspectives as to how to be successful. And this is something that the company defines and then comes up with some uh, critical success, success factors and then tactics and measures for moving further along. So I'm not sure why you would have a critical success factor there other than the fact I guess whoever put together this table couldn't think of one and just punted on it. Okay, 
All right, good. Cost of quality. Okay, when we look at our cost of quality, okay, we're going to have two cost of quality, conformance cost, and um, and our uh, non-conformance cost. Okay, so conformance cost and conformance costs fall into two categories: prevention and appraisal. Okay, so just go ahead and flashcard that at a high level. Our conformance costs, our prevention and appraisal, and flashcard that. Okay, now make another flashcard. This would be flashcard two that lists out prevention costs. And it's pretty easy, guys. It makes sense. You know, it's common, almost common sense, but I want you to flashcard them because we're going to see in a minute there could be a couple of questions where they say which of the following is a prevention versus appraisal cost, that kind of thing. So, what employee training is a prevention cost, inspection, preventive maintenance, redesign, redesign of processes search for higher quality uh, suppliers of supplies of materials uh, would you know be a way of preventing defects okay appraisal costs are statistically uh, statistical quality checks testing inspection maintenance of a laboratory that will uh, help to um, you know keep us um, from you know making these mistakes to begin with okay Non-conformance costs, and when we look at non-conformance costs, okay, and those fall into two broad categories. One is internal failure, the cost of an internal failure versus the cost of an external failure. So again, let's take the same approach, flashcard the two types, internal non-conformance versus external, okay? And then let's go ahead and make flashcards that call out the specifics as to an internal versus an external failure. Okay, so internal failure, rework cost. Okay, it doesn't hurt us outside the company, but we're going to have to rework defects, scrap, tooling changes, cost of disposal, cost of the lost unit, downtime. External failure. Okay, hey, we have to start paying warranty costs, cost of returning, liability claims lost customers, however you would quantify that, and re-engineering uh, for uh, external uh, failure, okay? All right, very common sense stuff, guys, but I want you to just go ahead and uh, flashcard those so that you can answer questions like those that, when you don't need that mnemonic, we got it flashcarded, uh, like the couple that we're gonna look at right here.
Okay, guys, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this one. And um, most of us got it right. Um, and it is purely a definitional um, thing here. The answer is, um, is D. And if we're talking about prevention costs, we're talking about what? We're talking about conformance costs. And our conformance costs fall into what? prevention and appraisal, uh, which is basically what they say. So even though they didn't call it conformance, they are calling them out in the two categories, prevention and appraisal. So trying to keep the problem from happening. So um, rework is not something because if you have to rework, that means you messed up. Equipment maintenance keeps our machinery from spoiling things, right? Uh, product testing keeps us from what? From having a problem because we're testing those products. Product repair means that their problem has occurred and now we have to fix it, right? So of the two, and look, they glorified this by making you, you know, add to those two numbers together to get the 1940. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at this next one. Okay, guys, uh, looks like everyone's had a chance to look at this one. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll a little quicker than usual. And uh, yeah, everyone got this right. Okay, so you start to look at these and I think you're seeing the pattern here. This is largely definitional, definitional uh, what is considered an internal failure cost, internal failure cost, right? Okay, well, good. Internal is what? Reworking, yeah, okay. Responding to customer complaints, that's what? That's external. Obviously, the customers are external. So you could sit there and you could see that uh, there's only a chance now that maybe, um, well, that's it. We're done. Okay, the answer would have to be A at that point, right? Okay, since there's no two only, there can't be three only, and they don't give us a choice with just one and three. Statistic quality control procedures are what? are a um, appraisal cost, right? Which is not an internal failure cost. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, largely definitional stuff, guys. Um, not the most uh, scintillating things in the world. Maybe kind of interesting. I don't know. Maybe give you something to talk about to your friends when you're, you're hanging out with them or something. I don't know. But uh, make sure you flashcard those definitions and then be ready for those types of questions. And I uh, again, we said this last time, we're talking about for all of this back part of chapter three, about five points. Okay, so they might hit one or two of these concepts. It's not like you're going to see every single one of them. The important part of chapter uh, three was the what the cost accounting stuff that we talked about. I said that was about 15 points. So, okay, all right, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a quick break, guys, because um, I don't want you to 
start getting tired here in a minute as we wrap up chapter three. And it's a while before we get to any multiple choice questions. So I'd rather you take the break now. Uh, I'm showing it about 606 here. So let's just shoot for what, uh, 620, six, would that be? 10 plus six would be 616. Um, let's shoot for, you know, around 620. Okay, and we'll come back. Just a little longer break, that's okay. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording. So uh, somebody please remind me to start it again when we come back. Resume the recording. And um, I know I'm a little behind on posting these up. So I'll get on that. I should have some time clear on Thursday to post up um, some of the back lectures. I think we got a couple that to plus today. So I think I got three off to post up. It's a little bit of a process to post them up. So. Sometimes I get a little behind on that, but we'll get uh, we'll get with that. Okay, okay, good. So what we're going to start to look now is performance management and uh, start looking at basically uh, ratios that can be used to evaluate the performance of the company. Um, part of me was thinking that I should ask you to maybe look at this on your own because it is a long discussion of uh, ratios, but then um, I think there are some things that I can point out that uh, might be helpful for you to just remember some key things about them, uh, but you are going to have to flashcard uh, these different ratios that are talked about here for evaluating um, the um, performance of an entity, starting with return on investment, okay? Now to give us this ROI, flow chart, and I find it uh, probably a little bit of an overkill. Uh, you can flashcard this, but at the end of the day, uh, when they go ahead and they do the calculations, you can see here that if we have uh, income divided by sales times sales divided by invested capital, what well, law of mathematics would tell you that you could get rid of the common element in both the numerator and denominator. And so the return on investment is going to be what is going to be income divided by invested capital. So even though I'm suggesting that you go ahead and make the flashcard that shows the whole flow chart, in case maybe a question gave you the profit margin, gave you the investment turnover, or maybe was going to make you go through, you know, they gave you that percentage already and you'd have to know to multiply those two together I think it's more likely if they want to have you calculate ROI they're going to give you the income number they're going to give you the invested capital and so if you look at what um, the next example did here again they gave us all of those elements but if we really just picked up the two that we need to be able to answer this question it was what it was the 40,000 net income and what and the invested capital of 250,000 if you plug those numbers in um, then you get what then you get the 40,000 divided by what divided by the 250,000 would have given us that same number would have given us the 16% uh, answer to this question so Again, go ahead and flashcard that whole flow chart and you would have probably used all the pieces if you were trying to use that flow chart here, but it wasn't necessary here uh, under the concept here that we just needed the income and the invested capital. Okay. Okay, good. Now, some of these are, you know, obvious by the name. Okay. Return on assets. Oh, and when I tell you to flashcard these, don't forget that I want you to look at the flashcards that Becker uh, provided as part of your purchase package. And if the cards are there, then you don't have to reproduce the card by writing them up. If not, if they don't have a, recar a card for return on assets, then you'll have to flashcard it yourself, okay? But return on assets is simply the net income divided by the average total assets. And don't forget guys, when you take the average total assets, unless the question just gave that to you, you'd have to take what the beginning balance of your total assets plus the ending balance of your total assets divide by two, and that's the average. Okay, so you'll see that in a lot of the uh, calculations when you look at the solution. 
Uh, if you have any trouble with that, um, you know, the reason they divide by two is because it's two numbers. To come up with the average, you divide by two. And they just use the beginning and the end as a rough approximation of what the average assets were. Okay. Now, there are variations in asset valuation. Net book value, I think you all know, is the asset's historical cost lifts its depreciation. Gross book value is just the historical cost. In other words, don't subtract the depreciation. Replacement cost is what it would cost you to reacquire that asset under current market conditions. Liquidation value, and that's rarely used for anything, is what you think you could sell that asset for at any point in time. It is sort of similar to a salvage value, but it's looking at the current date. What could I sell it for? And if I was trying to sell it, uh, you know, in a fairly uh, quick manner. Okay. Okay, good. Come over and let's just take a look. I don't know that you need to flashcard those. Those seem to me just sort of words that are used there. Um, I don't think that you need to have the definitions here. Okay, but uh, for the return on uh, assets, total assets, I mean, we're talking about what's reported on the financial reports, which is essentially what going to be the net book value, right? The, um, the original cost of the assets minus the depreciation. Okay, okay, good. Now they talk about some limitations of ROI. And don't forget guys, you do have written communication requirement on the BEC exam. And so I pretty much consistently ask you to flashcard these limitation um, you know, type things because I could see that potentially coming up in a um, essay question, okay? But uh, computations have the limitations in that it's a short-term focus. And so with the short-term focus, it's focusing on what short-term returns, maximizing short-term returns, uh, sometimes referred to as investment myopia. And it could be a, a disincentive to invest if you know that you're going to make an investment so you make that investment near the end of the year there's not time for that investment to generate income so what have you done you just lowered your uh, return on investment because you've increased the base without time to generate sales to make up uh, that difference and so an entity maybe would be uh, reluctant to go ahead and invest in a something that could be uh, productive over time right so it has a short-term focus okay Okay, good. Flash card on that. Return on equity is now instead of picking up the total assets, we have what? We have our net income divided by our equity. Hello. I mean, can there be anything easier than that? But flash card that, make sure you know how to calculate those. Now they start getting into uh, this DuPont analysis. Okay, and DuPont analysis is basically a three step analysis, which is going to look at our net profit margin. And we're also going to look at our asset turnover and look at something called financial leverage, which we've actually talked about financial leverage already on a um, in a separate lecture. But let's just go ahead and make sure that we flashcard the three components. Net profit margin, nothing earth shattering there, guys. Net income divided by sales. Then you come over to the next component of our DuPont um, ROI. And we have what we are, I should say, return on um, equity. DuPont ROE, return on equity. We have asset turnover, which is our sales divided by our assets. And then financial leverage is going to be our assets divided by our equity. And of course, the more debt we have, the lower our equity, the lower our equity divided into our assets, the higher our leverage. And we talked about that in the previous lecture, right? Once we kind of cover any fixed financing costs, then we start having some nice returns that all go towards profit. So the bigger that number, the better the leverage, right, is that equity piece starts to uh, get smaller. Now, of course, if it gets too small, now we are what? Now we're in a much riskier situation. And so uh, we want to find this right strike between a mix of equity and debt financing. Now, when you take a look 
to calculate the DuPont ROE, it is the interaction of the three of those. You simply multiply those together, okay? If you're looking for the DuPont uh, return on equity, you could also look at it as the return on assets, okay? Which we, uh, you know, because you get rid of the common, don't strike them out guys for your flashcard, but you get rid of the common uh, elements there. And what you basically has have done is reduce that down to the return on assets times the financial leverage. And you could, uh, you know, abbreviate that equation that way. Okay. Now, when we get into the extended DuPont model, we start bringing in some additional concepts and now start to consider tax. For example, tax burden. Tax burden is our net income divided by our pre-tax income. Our pre-tax income was 100 and our net income is 60. Then we have what a you know 40 percent um, uh, net income is 40. Then we would have a 40 percent tax burden. Okay. All right, good. Come over. Interest burden is going to be basically our pre-tax income divided be by earnings before interest and taxes, commonly referred to as EBIT. I think you've heard that term, but you can flashcard that. And then you come over and um, you take a look at the extended DuPont return on uh, uh, equity formula, and it is basically all of those um, items that we've looked at previously multiplied together, and you can flashcard that. Okay, these things to me, guys, at some point, and I'm not going to go through the detailed calculation of each one of those. I don't think I need to sit here and you know pick numbers out of any out of a paragraph and show you how to divide one by the other. There's no real trick to those. And, you know, these start to become um, things that are talked about and you kind of cherry pick which ones seem to be the right ones for whatever analysis you're doing. Uh, but for the CPA exam, it's something that you're just going to need to know how to calculate these different things um, by memorizing your flashcards. Now, we look at something called residual income and residual income is going to be income that is left after we have met a certain uh, target rate of return known as the hurdle rate. And as we've said in previous discussions, but you can flashcard again, often the entity will use what we talked about, I guess it was chapter two, the weighted average cost of capital could be used to calculate that hurdle rate. Now, when we come up with our residual income, it's our net income, which we pick up from the income statement, minus the required rate of return. And the required rate of return is going to be the entity's net book value, their equity, right? Times that hurdle rate. And again, that hurdle rate could be determined by the weighted average cost of capital. Okay. So let's just go ahead and take a look at the interpretation of that. And I think it's pretty positive, uh, pretty obvious, I should say, that a positive residual income indicates performance is meeting standards. Negative residual income means that um, the performance is not meeting uh, standards. And you can flashcard that. And then just take a look at this very simple example. Um, the entity produces net income of 30,000, okay? And we wanna see if we're getting over our hurdle rate. The net book value, the uh, equity of the entity is 200,000 and our hurdle rate is 10%. So we have residual income of 10,000, okay? All right, good. Come over and uh, let's take a look at some of the benefits of residual income. And I'm going to ask you to flashcard that because SA, potential SA question, okay, includes ease of measurement of actual dollars earned by an investment above the required amount. So just give you some buzzwords there in case someone talks about, wants you to talk about the benefits. Weaknesses of residual income, and let's flash card, and you can make that basically one flash card, what are the benefits versus weaknesses, so you're used to thinking of them in tandem to respond to an essay question, but use of absolute amount to compute performance distorts comparison of units with unequal size, larger units 
of an organization may produce larger dollar volume of residual income, even though their performance is identical to a smaller unit. So, um, you know, they're going to not be performing as much. Uh, they may be performing equally over that target rate, even though their residual income number is uh, larger. So that would be a disadvantage. You can flashcard that. Okay. Okay, good. Economic added value. Okay. And let's just go ahead and take a look at the formula for economic added value. And it's net operating income after taxes, net operating income after taxes, otherwise known as NOPAT, minus the required return. And again, required return is the investment times the weighted average cost of capital. Okay, so we're picking up a number net operating profit after taxes. So they're leaving out things like what? gains and losses on sale of equipment. They're leaving out interest cost here and they're just coming up with this number, uh, no PAT, no uh, operating profit after taxes, okay? So um, let's just look at um, the next page. Yeah, I'm just, I always kind of debate where to go to the example. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at the whole outline in the order that it comes. I'm always kind of motivated to look at that example first, but let's not do that. Let's just go through in the order that it's perceived here, laid out here. So what happens? We have what positive economic value added in case the performance is meeting standards, a negative EVA means that the performance is not meeting standard. You can flashcard that. Okay. Now, when we look at the economic uh, um, added value, what we can do is capitalize research and development. Okay. Now, we capitalize research and development when we're talking about economic added value because under US GAAP rules, okay, again, getting more into an accounting concept, research and development, all research and development expenses are all costs are expensed, right? They're expensed. And so if you're thinking about a company like Tesla, you know, you saw Tesla's financial statements for years were showing a negative net income because they were expensing all this research and development Meanwhile, you know, they're developing this product that the whole world's going to want. That's probably going to continue into the future as they're, you know, high tech company. And so what you could do is add back the research and development costs, capitalize them rather than expense them. That's going to bring up the income. That's going to bring up your uh, investment. And um, so you could make that sort of an adjustment away from US GAAP to calculate uh, economic added value. Also, you may use current valuations on the balance sheet as opposed to uh, historical costs. You can go ahead and flashcard those two things. They could be adjustments when you're calculating economic um, value added. Income determination. No PAT may be adjusted to eliminate the effect of certain transactions and thereby create nearly cash. And you can go ahead and flashcard that. The adjustments to the balance sheet effect on the income statement. Okay, so if we're going ahead and capitalizing certain things. That's going to take some expenses off of the balance sheet. Of course, it probably increase our depreciation a little bit, but I think you're going to have an overall, you know, increase on the. Uh, on the um, net income that way, uh, capitalizing the research and development and deferred taxes are ignored. So flashcard that, okay? And let's just look at this example. And at the end of the day, since there's these sort of adjustments and even though we flashcarded them, it's not like they're gonna ask us to pull out what things we have to adjust for. They're basically going to tell us what they want us to do. And we just simply have to follow directions, follow the instructions. So let's just look at this. Instafab Manufacturing has an investment in Southeast Regional Plant with an investment of 300,000 after adjusting for, and they tell me, capitalization of research and development costs and revaluation of certain assets. So they picked up those things uh, that they talked about and didn't make us do any calculation here to get to those. The company's cost of capital 
is 12% is division produces net operating profit after taxes, right? So they're sitting there and they're picking up the operating profit, but they are subtracting the tax portion off of that of 50,000. After adjustments for current year research and development, asset reevaluation, other accounting considerations, calculate the economic value added, and they go ahead and they call out the NOPAT. The investment is 300,000, cost of capital is 12. So we have what? We have our required return, and the difference is the economic value uh, added. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, you can see, guys, that to be successful on these questions, it's a lot of flashcarding and memorization and then looking at the problems, seeing how the problems laid things out, looking back at the flashcards. Again, I tend to think of this more of a jogging exercise than a weightlifting exercise, and that you're just going to have to repeat with these things enough times until you've got the wind to be able to work through uh, these kinds of problems that we're seeing here, uh, starting with this question, um, this question one now in our new module here. So let's just go ahead and uh, take a look at this one. Okay, guys, go ahead and uh, take your best shot on this one now. And um, let's take a look at the solution together here. And just take a look at how we did, I should say the results. And um, yeah, good, 94% of us got it correct. Um, and the answer is what the passenger division had a better performance when you're using ROI. And so let's just go ahead and uh, first realize that external borrowing rate is what we call in the CPA exam business a distractor. We are worried about what just the return on investment, which again, as I had said before, they gave us that sort of longer flow chart showing it, but uh, generally the problem they're just going to give you the elements you need to get the ROI and all that detail that feeds into it. And so for our passenger, I'm just going to put pass up here. Okay, it was 40 divided by 250. What's that, 
And for the cargo, it was now what? 50,000 divided by 500,000. And that gave us what? 10%. So the passenger, uh, which is better, the passenger division uh, with an ROI of 16%. Okay. Okay, good. Let's look at question number two. Okay, guys, let's just go ahead and uh, give them some time to think about that one. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll here and um, share the results. And good, another good turnout, 88% of us got it right. And I find it interesting here that a couple of us were thinking that C or D um, might be the correct answer. But my, you know, mathematics, which isn't great, but... Uh, decent enough. If I think about the concept of residual income, what happens? I have asset, I have a required rate of return, and then I'm looking to see how that generated some profit, right? That's over that target amount. So if I make an investment on the last day of the year, there's not enough time for that asset to generate sufficient return, right, to give me residual income. And it's not going to add to my income that much because I haven't had that asset that long. Meanwhile, the base that I'm using to calculate my required return has increased. So it seems unlikely to me, and if someone's got a mathematical scenario where you think that they could move in opposite directions, I'd like to hear it. Because if you've increased the base, then... I don't see how it's going to, you know, you know, decrease one while increasing the other. So I can immediately get rid of C and D unless I'm missing something. Now, when I look at what's left now, I'm like, well, look, if I make an investment last day of the year, there's not time for it to generate sufficient income. So the 
the base that I'm using to calculate my hurdle rate has gone up. Meanwhile, my income level hasn't had a chance to reflect that. And so it's going to do what? It's going to decrease both the return on my investment because my base is increased and thus my residual income because there'll be no uh, increase in income. There won't be time for the increase in income to be reflected. Choi, uh, question, thoughts on how I looked at that? Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at number three and make sure guys you're going through these questions because again, I'm not sure I understood how we got C and D in those last uh, round, but um, make sure that um, you know, you're going through these questions carefully together here. Okay, all right, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at question three. I'll give you a little more time with this one since there's a couple of uh, calculations and connections you need to make to be able to answer this. Okay, we're coming up on three minutes. What's going on, guys? I don't see a lot of uh, response here. Okay. Okay, a little bit better, guys. Uh, don't get me in the mode where I have to start calling out individuals to see what's happening, okay? Uh, everyone should be following along and participating, okay? So let's go ahead and... Uh, I'll give you two more seconds. Okay, good. So we're getting pretty close. We still got a couple of folks in our participating. I'll give okay, I'll give you four minutes. Sorry to rush you, but now I'm giving you more time. But I don't want to give you the feeling that you should be taking four minutes to answer a question because you really should be taking what? two minutes, three minutes at the most to answer any one question. This might be one that takes you a little longer. It's got a couple steps to it. 
Okay, all right, good. So let's just go ahead then and um, end the poll and let's take a look at the results. Okay, 63% of us got it uh, correct. The answer is C. Okay, but let's just um, look at this together. And the way I see this problem, again, the reason the flashcards are so important, if I'm asking for return on equity, then I'm going to need to get what? I'm going to need to get the profit divided by the um, equity. Okay, so they tell me that I had sales of two million and a profit margin of eleven percent. Okay, so if that's the case, then I know I've got to get this two million times the 0.11 is going to give me what, um, if I'm doing my math right, 220,000 of profit. So I've got my numerator. And then the denominator, they made a little more tricky on me and that they said, well, they decided to reduce the debt ratio to 40% from 50%. Well, if that's the case, then that means that what? That the equity component is now 60%, right? Okay, if I'm trending my debt equity to 40 from 50, that means that my equity component is going to be 60%. So now I pick up what? The total assets, 2,500,000, okay? And I have to multiply that by 0.6 to get that equity component since the debt component assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. If my debt component is 40% of that number, then the only portion left that can be the equity portion is that 0.6. So I take the 2.5, divide that by the 0.6. That gives me a denominator here of 1,500,000, right? If I'm doing my math right, I don't think I need all those commas. 1,500,000. Okay, and when I do the math on that now, divide the 220,000 profit by the 1,500,000, I get the correct answer, the 14.7. Question? Okay, good. Let's look at number four.
Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and um, give you 30 more seconds. Okay, looks like most of us have had a chance to look at this, um, but let's just uh, see that uh, good percentage, 88% got it uh, correct. And again, I think you're seeing with a lot of these uh, analysis that it starts to become a sort of, you know, repetition of using the different uh, techniques that we've learned here. This is uh, economic value added, and they give us our operating profit of three million. Okay, and to come up with the economic um, three hundred million, and I think what made this question difficult uh, for me was um, that my calculator couldn't take numbers this big, right? Uh, so if you run into something like this, I think the exam calculators which are similar to the ones that you have on your computer, will be able to take larger numbers. But if you run into trouble, just you know, truncate some of those numbers at the end and then add the uh, three um, decimals you know, to get yourself to uh, the particular choices, right? But it was 300 million, okay? And if the tax rate is what? 40%, and if I'm doing economic value added, I got to come up with that notepad, right, after the taxes. So I pick up that operating profit times, and I multiply that times 0.6. That gives me a notepad here of 180 million. And again, my big problem is making sure I'm keeping all the zeros there, okay? And then I have to figure out the cost of capital. Now, what made this question a little bit different from what we saw when we were looking at it, rather than just give me one number for the cost of capital, they say, well, 50% is debt and 50% is equity, the capital used to generate the profit. So if I take the 1,200,000, and I multiply that by 0.5, that means that what, 600 million, and again, the hard part for me was making sure I got all the zeros in there. You wouldn't think a guy who worked for the government all those years would have trouble with these big numbers, right? But 600 million is going to be the, um, and we'll just say that's the debt piece. The equity piece is also 50%, it's gonna be 600 million. And then I just apply the particular cost of capital to each one of those. So uh, if I'm doing the, uh, what the debt is 5%, so times 0.05, and the equity is 15%, 0.15, and I do the extension on that, I have to subtract what, I have to subtract the, what does that come out to, uh, 30 million? for the cost of the debt and for the cost of the equity, I have to subtract 90 million. I'm doing my math right. Okay, and when you subtract those two, you get this 60 million EBA, which makes B the correct answer. Okay, question. Okay, guys, we're early in finishing chapter three, and my initial thought was that I would jump into chapter four, but I'm going to change that because what I want you to do for chapter four, okay, and I'm going to ask you to do this on your own, is to look at um, the ratio analysis, which is module three in chapter three, excuse me, chapter four, module three in chapter four, ratio analysis. I'm gonna ask you to look at that on your own. I'm not particularly interested in sitting here and walking through ratio after ratio after ratio with you. We've been using some of those ratios here tonight together. You see that my recommendation is flashcard them, memorize them, apply them to the problems, okay? So uh, what I'm gonna do is end the class now, 
Uh, this is a great opportunity for you to catch up any homework that you're behind on. Okay, you can go through now and finish up BEC3. And we're going to hit the ground running next week with BEC4. We'll do modules one, two, and maybe even get into module four, three. I'm asking you to look at on your own, primarily focusing on flashcards, but you do also have the lectures there if you want to watch the national structures instructors sit there and babble. I mean, continue on and talk to you about divide this by this to get the current ratio and so on, which is all they do in that discussion. Okay, but you do have to have all the ratios. Just memorize the ratios, guys. That's the best advice I can give you. Question? Okay, it's going to be short class tonight then. Make sure you are keeping up with your homework. I am starting to um, you know, spy on you a little bit to see how you're doing on that. So you want to uh, make sure that you um, don't want to get an email from me saying what's going on. Okay, question? Uh, Andrew, can you hang on uh, after class here? I got a question for you. Um, and other than that, I'm going to stop the recording. And if there's no other questions, I ask everyone else to leave the meeting so I can uh, have a conversation with Andrew unless somebody else has something. <laughs>